my gun, Jin. This fuel is love, and you got to treat people with love when you're making these kind of movies because they're not there for the money. You either got to make no. people do movies and projects for two reasons because they're getting paid or because they love it. Hopefully, it's both. When, when you can get both, you're lucky. Yeah. But you got to give them one or the other. And if you can't give them money, you got to give them love. Right. So, what do you say to the trend of shooting on iPhones? Like, do you see yourself um, ever being so enthusiastic or so um, passionate about a project that you could see yourself, uh, you know, in order to cut costs or uh, to cut in on the budget, like shooting on an iPhone? Uh, I mean, Soderbergh does it, so. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, that guy can, can do it. You know what? <laughs> it's really, it's something that is really, really exciting for me. Uh, I love that kind of thing. I, I constantly, especially because right now I'm at a weird place in my career where I'm kind of just full-time filmmaking, which is really great. But there's mm -hmm. also, it's also me getting used to these big gaps between while I'm waiting for this budget to close and that to happen or, or festivals and just that. So it's like when I get bored, I just start creating new things, new projects. And so I'll go from, you know, walking away from a $2 million movie where I made some money and I can take this time off, but then also going, well, like, I should just get some people together and make something really cheap for fun. Yeah. And so I look at stuff like the iPhone and I'm like, what a great, you know, I have an iPhone. What a great resource and tool. And so it's the kind of thing where I'm like, I want to play with it more and, and do something like that. I haven't sat down to do it, um, uh, but I think at some point, when I know I've got a gap of time between something, I think I will just get together and do like a really nitty gritty mumble core type project. Just to, if nothing else is a, is a, is a test to explore uh, one of these things. But also I think like as much as I want to explore that kind of technology, I think I would also want to use this, a project like this as a way to explore like self distribution and just other stuff like that, and just go. This is what this project is designed for. It's designed to see if uh, if we keep these costs low and, and do it, do it kind of like a co-op, where you know I'm not getting paid, no one's getting paid. We're all doing this just for the love of a project, but we're all going to split after. And in between us, can we get it out there and, and do that? And just so there's something really exciting about that. And also because the other thing is like when I did sex with your kids, it was one of those things where I was like. You follow the rules. Make a list of all the locations you can get for free, of all the other stuff. And I, I actually stole um, the manifesto that Steven Soderbergh had passed around when he did Full Frontal. Like he had written this like one or two page manifesto that he sent to all the cast when he sent them the script. And it was like, you will drive yourself to set. You will bring your own wardrobe. You will do your own makeup. You will. I think he said you'll bring your own food, which is like that's. I was not going to do that. That's the one. <laughs> like you can't. Soderbergh can get away with it. The rest. Soderbergh can get away with it. He was. He had made Ocean's Eleven by that point. Right. And then, I think even then I'm like, you have Ocean's Eleven money. You pay for the goddamn food, Mr. Soderbergh. Don't be that guy. Uh, but stuff like you'll drive yourself to set. You will not have a trailer. You will not have all this. So it's like, but you will have fun. You will get a character that you get complete control over to create and explore with. Um, and I will only take up two or three days of your time on, on set kind of thing. And right. so I, every single actor I sent the script out to, I don't think anyone turned it down. They were all so game. And a lot of them came from my first movie. They came back from that one and they had such a good time. And they thought the movie turned out so well. Uh, and then so I got lucky in that I, I had access to a pool of great acting talent but that's also from just being you know if you live in a city where other productions are happening if you're lucky enough to do that even if it's just like solid theater you got to be aware of the talent inside your community and you got to know who's there and you got to find ways to get to know them you got to find ways to network with them to get them to know your work because that's how those little things happen at the beginning you get lucky you find I think, you know, um, uh, Mark Duplass talks about that, too. He talks about, I think, in his his uh, speech, he, his big uh, South by Southwest address, 
he called it like Randy something. He made it Randy like a, Hercules. Randy Hercules. So you got to find your Randy Hercules. Uh, and and find someone that champions you a little, as much as you can, right? Because, I mean, many people don't aren't, aren't lucky and don't find that person for a while. But it's like you got to find you got to you, you, being a filmmaker is is this part of a support system, part of a community, and you really you need to do that, right? It's like it's the one it's the one thing that sucks about the art form, uh, but it's also great about the art form is that it it has to be collaborative because you can't do it on your own and so what do you what do you spend it on it's like you're because you already own the equipment so you're not spending it on equipment right i assume you're using the stuff you already got well i i bought i i'm treating it the uh, the other thing i said is i'm treating it as if like um the as if somebody got a like a really great idea in the shower and they jumped out super excited and they googled how to make a movie on my phone and like what are the bare essentials equipment that you can get away with um to buy and then what do you need from that and then just sort of take off from there and so for me i'm kind of exploring uh what do what are you going to spend money on um yeah. we've talked about i mean because you've already got the phone technically yeah. you've already got the phone i think uh, here's a question about that though so you got the phone you need something that's better for sound i would assume Right, right, right. Uh -um. That's one thing. Sound's always the thing that it's like you can't skimp on either because sound people don't like to work for free. Yeah, no. Uh, but here's my other question then, because this is the thing that I've that's always tripped me up about uh, using my phone, and I finally have a phone that has a decent amount of like hard drive space on it, but uh, the workflow in terms of like getting footage off and dumping it and, and just like how much time that eats out of your day or if usually your phone can hold enough for the day and then you just offload it at night and just all that kind of workflow because you still you have to buy hard drives I assume yeah digital so you need like you need backups and you need copies so well got to be part of your cost right right hard that's that's got to be part of, but we did find sort of a solution to that end um there at least with the iphone i'm sure there's probably something for the android as well but uh there is the these little drives where the male end is a lightning cable and the female okay. end is usb you plug it into your phone and it works via this app and you can literally drag and drop uh footage also audio clips onto this little uh drive and they're very tiny and uh they come in several flavors i think up to about 128 gigs and then you just take them and transfer the stuff over it, depending on how much you're trying to transfer. Like if you're transferring 128 gigs of footage, it's going to take you a little bit. So you can, you'd have to stop production during that. But if you're just transferring over. Well, you, like, do that when you're, you just you offload when you're changing set or something. Right, when you're changing set and stuff like that. So, you know, you do that and then you put it on this little flash drive and the flash drive plugs into uh, any computer, whether it's a Mac or a PC, you can just offload it right there to uh an external hard drive or to an internal hard drive right. it's just and those things are thirty dollars what do they call it? what's the brand pour it out it's uh kingston bolt uh they're kingston. yeah and there'll be a link in the description for those things they're fantastic um the only thing that 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 you have to watch is that they come under this thing called the fat 32 rule which is every uh there's a certain file size that whether it's a, uh, a uh, SD card or uh, like, a, you know, these little uh, flash memory things they do not do uh, at, in terms of large size. That file size is 4.3 gigs. And the thing is, if you're shooting on Filmic Pro at its highest setting in 4K, you're shooting about a gig a minute. So at four minutes, roughly around four minutes, that's when your clip is going to take a crap. Um, whether it's on your phone and then it, you also can't transfer it over. So you have to watch the time when you're shooting. If you plan to shoot at that high gig rate, you don't have to, you can certainly shoot a lower bit rate. But if you're shooting at that super high Filmic Pro extreme bit rate, you have to watch your time. Three minutes, you got to quit because otherwise it's going to make trying to get that clip. Yeah. Uh, no, but that's kind of shit people don't know and they get fucked up because it's like, you know, in the old film days, like you have a 10 minute reel. Most, most, Mags are ten minutes, right? Right. Um, 
and uh, but now, now it's three or four. Yeah, three or four. Well, so those yeah. players. It just it, it we didn't know and we I've never heard anything like that I, so we didn't know and we were doing this long take in the my last short film and we only got a few takes that actually went through Fuck. like yeah and we did eight takes of this five minute thing and it just quit. Could like, you though just if you're on an iPhone break it up and be like save this as a smaller part say this is a smaller part and then just sync it up later. Certain cameras do do that. The C100 will do that because it also has that rule because it's shooting on SD cards. So right. it knows that it has that FAT32 rule. So it, once it gets to that point, it switches over to another uh, clip so that you don't uh, lose the footage. But the iPhone doesn't know that. It doesn't know that. So my question is this. It's like, what what's the difference quality-wise in, say, like, is three minutes at this highest quality bit rate for you versus like dropping it down like even to half and getting twice the amount of time but at, at half the bit rate? Like is it a significant drop in quality? Well, I don't it's more like in terms of uh, a post production thing because it, you're going to throw a lot on it and you're going to throw different color correction things on it. But also the idea of the whole thing of 4K is you're shooting such a big frame that you can cut in. Now, when you have that high bit rate, you can just do it. Just frame properly, bitch. I know, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> so, I hate that. I hate people like, I don't need to get, shoot a medium shot now because I shot this super wide. It's like, no, you didn't. Yeah, because your fucking depth in. of field is wrong for doing that framing. It's like you would never shoot. I fucking hate that. I mean, well, the thing about it, and like, and this is sort of a positive, is that shooting on the iPhone, I realized that it's kind of like, uh, like, you know, if you've been shooting guns, you're like, and somebody hands you this giant desert eagle, and they're like, man, you, you really got to do it. And you'd be like, what, this, this pistol's got this kind of power? And then you're like, I've been shooting pistols my whole life. I can shoot this. And you pull, you you know, you get behind it, you take your stance, and it blows you right out of your boots because you the raw power of the iPhone or yeah, well, phones in general, but definitely the iPhone in terms of video was actually actually kind of stunning to me. And so what? So I what phone? Are, what iPhone are you using? I'm using the X, the iPhone X. How I have a seven. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that for making a movie? Uh, I, I actually uh, a guy uh. Uh, Brian Drolet just made a movie called Be Like Trees. Um, the link to the movie that will be in the description below. He just released that on YouTube. He shot that whole thing on an iPhone 7. Um, yeah. So it it works. And there's some beautiful stuff. He did a whole uh, music video inside of his movie and stuff like that that takes place, uh, uh, I think it's a Joshua tree. And it looks gorgeous. And it's got special effects in it and everything else. And it holds up. And so you could do it. Like, you know, uh, I think if you've got anything after the six, like, it should hold up. I Me, mean, even though Tangerine, I think, was done on a five. Yeah, I think so, too. What about interlacing and that kind of stuff? Do you find, like, problems with like, handheld and, and, and movement? Uh, we had ours on a gimbal, and it, but we moved the entire time. It was fine. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it balanced fine. And, like, we had, a, like, this, not a cheap gimbal, but, like, a relatively inexpensive. It cost us 100 bucks, And we moved the entire time. And had no problems. Yeah, that's what I heard was like sometimes that it, it, it can. It's not necessarily friendly to movement in the way. It you... just depends. If you're doing really shaky movement, like really, I, I don't think it has that kind of thing. The kind of place, the kind of way that you could shake a DSLR, um, even with the the stabilizer. the, the stabilizer stuff like that. Yeah, I don't. You can't shake it like that, but you can like. Uh, have a little bit of shake as long as it's propped up on something like that. I think that it, it's the same as anything. I think people just got to know the limitations of the tool they're using because red cameras have limitations, the same as like Ari's have limitations. You know, they all have little things. Every lens you got to shoot with. That's why you do camera tests if you're shooting with lenses. You got to know what these lenses can and cannot do. Right. So it's like you just got to learn what tools you have and what their capabilities are. So when you're running and gunning, and on a thousand dollar movie, you're running and gunning from the time you wake up to the time you pass out that night. Right. You don't go to sleep when you're making a thousand dollar movie. You pass <laughs> the fuck out. <laughs> and what do you use for sound? Talk to me. Uh, I use the what I refer to as a Swiss Army knife. 
of, of sound, uh, I use the H4N. H4N is my constant companion um, because you can use it as a, as a boom. Uh, like I've taped it to a broom handle and held it over my actors. Uh, I've hit it in the scene. My second movie was all about where could we creatively hide this freaking thing? And it got great sound. And when we didn't lob the actors, uh, when we couldn't lob the actors or something like that because we were moving the camera or like the actors were moving, like we just stuck the H4 in and in a place where that was out of sight and just shot yeah. on it and got great sound. So I feel like You're, we're hiding mics all the time. When when you do a sex scene, my friend, right, <laughs> out of mic. Right. So I think, I think the, the H4N I feel like is the most underrated piece of film equipment. Um, it it is so versatile and it gets such great sound, and it's so easy to use. And the file sizes are very small, even though it's, uh, it comes out in WAV format. Um, you just pop a SD card in there, and you can just shoot all day and never really have to worry about changing cards. It's really really great. We live in such a fantastic time where it's it's nobody. You have no. I mean, I'm not the first to say this, but it's like. If you want to make something, you got zero excuse to get right. out there, get off your ass, and make something. Uh, and even for a thousand dollars, like we have, I have a friend here. Uh, her name is Ingrid Veninger, and uh, she's like the DIY queen of Canadian film. And she makes movies at this budget level, and she's made a ton. And she won uh, like a five thousand dollar prize uh, at something. And you know what she did with it? She ran a contest for five other filmmakers to make five $1,000 films. Wow. She didn't put that in her pocket. She's like, no, I'm going to produce five films now. You know? And so I have a bunch of friends. There's these guys called the Butler Brothers. They made this movie called Morning is Broken for $1,000. And then they've gone on to now they're making movies at a, much, at, at, a, at a higher level. But it's like that's the kind of thing that really got them inspired and jazzed. And, uh, and same thing. It's just like... You got no reason. You got no excuses other than I don't want to work hard. Here's the other thing. It's like I will say it's like as much as like having that gear, having that all the stuff, all the tools, the passion. The other thing that you got to have, uh, and I'm actually, you know, I'm going to plug myself. Uh, I'm I'm, I'm uh, teaching a course in Toronto this summer that's basically about this about this idea that how to, it's it's kind of called how to get off your ass and make your own damn thing. Uh, and the idea that it's like there's no reason you can't do these things yourself, and so I'm, that's why I'm stealing your little your list of resources for tools because I don't, <laughs> I don't know those. No, it's great because I love to be able to pass those on to the students. Um, but the other thing, and I think the main difference, as much as my first film, people the people that finally saw it and did see it and continue to see it really loved it. Uh, it didn't have a hook. It didn't really have a great hook to it. Where Sex After Kids, that thing connected because. When I was doing the crowdfunding, I went after like mommy bloggers and other people. And it's like, what I realized from that movie was that my, it had a built-in audience of people that were going through this very universal thing that connected to them. And so I think the, the really, really important thing, as much as like, I, I do very much believe in this, like just tell something that you would love that's personal to you and it'll naturally become universal to others and, and reach out. It's like, you do got to make sure that it's like, Am I telling something that is universal? That is like, that is, it's not, that the story doesn't have to be like, you know, snakes on a plane. It doesn't have to be like, have like a giant hook, like a crazy over the top hook. But what you got to do is you got to make sure that you're making something that poses a question that when you bring it up and you pitch it to people, they're like, oh shit, I got to see that. I got to watch at least five, 10 minutes of that. Because it's got to sound, it's got to have enough of a hook that people go, oh, I want to see what you do with that idea. Well, I think the, also the thing that you were talking about earlier is because most people are going to be watching things on their phones, content is so niche right now. And if you can find that audience, that specific audience for your film, where you're, like you said, you know, you went out to mommy bloggers and things like that and stuff like that. If you have a film that appeals to that audience and you can get within that community, like go on Reddit or Twitter or Facebook yeah. and find those folks and then say, okay, uh, what do you think about this? I, I made a movie about this 
And if you can get that audience and then, of course, it can hop from those folks as they expose it to other people. They say, hey, man, so and so made a great movie about this thing that I love. You know, I love this thing. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't steer you wrong on something like that. And that's how things cross over. So, uh, you know. I, I will take it a step further. I will say the only successful filmmakers working today are niche filmmakers because we do not have films don't break out the way they do. Even like you get Tom Holland in an indie film, it's still not going to do Spider-Man money. It's still right. not going to break out in the way that you want it to do just because you got Tom Holland, you know, unless it's like a genre film, unless it's like something niche, because we don't have the resources to market to everybody. You know, that's why these tentpole movies do well, because they spend hundreds of millions of dollars in marketing to everybody. And that's the only reason they perform. I mean, you have a movie like Avengers Endgame. It's the 22nd movie in this fucking franchise. They still spend a half a billion dollars on fucking marketing. Right. right. Or whatever they spent on marketing. It's insane. Or, you know, it, it, and that's, the, that's a movie that everyone knows is coming. They still, it's all in bus shelters everywhere. Posters are everywhere. So it's yeah. like for us... All you can do is you, you tap my, my producing partner and I, Jordan Walker, our philosophy is that it's like make a movie for three out of 10 people that they will fucking love. Don't worry about the other seven. You don't care about them. You know, you're making a movie for three out of 10 people that they will love and they will talk about to their friends and they'll go out and share. And then, like you said, it's like and then it trends over and it breaks out. But it's like if you try to make a movie for like as wide an eye as possible. And that's all I mean is like. Whatever genre you're working, whatever idea you're working in, make sure those people will be like, I'd really love to see how will you do with that idea. It's been a, a super great conversation. Uh, yeah, I really uh, enjoyed this. Yeah, I really, really loved it. And um, we've got to get together and, and do another one of these, man, like a part two or something like that. This was, this was super great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe I'll be more focused next time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... Uh, you got anything you want to plug before we give it up? Like anything? Yeah, I'm just thinking if there's any like last minute advice. I feel, so it's like I feel like we we touched some stuff, right? We're helping people here. We're not. Right. <laughs> we're not just hanging out like buddies. No, no. Okay, I'm, cool. Because yeah, it's it's tough, and then there's so many different uh, there's so many different ways to, to make to to cut corners and cut things. But it's like it's really it's like I think it's like my number one advice be like feed people with love and food. Uh, and make sure you got a, tor a story worth telling that people will be interested in, and then just like just work, just be ready to work hard. And because you, if you can't, no one's gonna force you to do this. This is not for everyone, and it shouldn't be for everyone. Right. Uh, in terms of stuff to plug, uh, so much stuff. I got all my movies. Uh, just go to iTunes and type in Jeremy Lalonde. All my movies will come up. You can get on iTunes in the states. Um, my more recent films, How to Plan an Orgy in a Small Town, The Go-Getters, they're all on multiple VOD platforms. You can get them even like hard copies uh, in stores in the States. Uh, and Sex and for Kids is out there too. They're all there. I have a podcast called Black Hole Films that you can get on uh, all the podcasty type things that's about people uh, watching movies they've always meant to see but never got around to. And then uh -huh. I have I force them to talk about it right away. And I will put a link uh, to that podcast. I'm also subscribed to that, and I've listened to quite a few episodes. Yeah. So so that's that's the main thing. And you can go to I, I'm on Twitter. I'm at Lalon Jeremy. My my website is jeremylalon.com. Instagram I think is jeremylalon as well. So I'm on all the social things. I uh, I'm easily to reach. And uh, yeah, this has been great. Yeah, man. Thank you for being so generous with your time. Uh, I know you're in between things and you're you're working on stuff, uh, but uh, thank you for giving me the time and and, and coming on and, and and helping to share some back with the community, man. My pleasure. I love doing this kind of stuff. All right. Um, so Jeremy Lalonde, thank you so much, and uh, we'll talk soon. Thanks, buddy. All right. Yeah, you love it, Qui Gon Jinn.